Okay, so solutions. Problem one is all about limit notation. Um, hopefully this is familiar by now. I think the main points to remember are that uh, in a graph, f of x tells you the y value for a particular x coordinate. So what we're asking here is, what's happening to the y values when x gets closer and closer and closer to infinity? So we're looking at x values that get larger and larger and larger, and we're interested in a pattern of where the y values are approaching. I think in this particular graph, it's implied here by the picture that there's a horizontal asymptote at negative three. So the limit in that case would be negative three. As x approaches negative infinity, that's looking at what happens as the x values get uh, larger in the negative direction. It looks like the y values just continue to increase forever. So some teachers and some textbooks will have you write infinity there, and that's perfectly fine. Um, for reasons that will become clearer later in calculus, I prefer not to think about this as being equal to infinity because infinity isn't a number that works the same way as other numbers you're familiar with. So I prefer to say that it increases without bound, which is just a way of saying they keep going up, up and up forever and there's no particular y value that's above all of the other ones. Um, that's what it would mean to be bounded, is if all of the y values are beneath a particular largest y value. So we're saying it approaches infinity, which means it's increasing without bound. All right, limit as x approaches 6. So in order for, uh, in order for the y values to have a limit at x equals 6, the limit from the left has to be the same as the limit from the right. Um, but it's not necessary that the value of f be defined at 6. So th this could be an open circle. There could be no defined value at 6, but it could still have a limit. In this particular case, uh, it looks like as you're approaching 6 from the right-hand side, so when you start out larger than 6 and you're approaching 6, the y values seem to be approaching negative 1.5. So that would be an answer to this part of the problem. But from the left, it looks like they're approaching 1. So because there's this discontinuity there, the limit, the overall limit at 6 is not defined. So you would say does not exist. Well, sorry, it's not that it's not defined. It's defined perfectly well. It's just that it doesn't exist at that point. Um, what about the limit at x equals 1? So here you've got another discontinuity. Um, so for the same reason, the limit there doesn't exist either. Um, if we're approaching 1 from the negative side, that would be here. So it looks like the y values are approaching infinity. So you could write infinity, but again, I prefer increases without bound. As x approaches negative 5, here the, the y values from the right-hand side and from the left-hand side look like they're both going towards the same place right here. So it looks like they're, they're headed towards zero. So the overall limit would be zero. Um, and then this one is asked, because the overall limit is defined, the right-hand part of that limit should equal the same thing as the overall limit. So that's also zero. Couple of quick clarifications. So in this graph, I might ask, what is the limit of f of x as x approaches two? Um, and the answer is three, even though the value of the function at x equals two is actually five. So the limit is three because the limit is about what are the y values approaching. The limit has nothing to do with what happens when x actually gets there. Um, and then, as I just said, the actual value of the function at 2 equals 5. So that's one point of clarification. Second, consider this set of contrasting statements. If the limit as x approaches k of f of x equals 7, then the right-hand limit also equals 7. That's one statement. If the And then this other statement would be the converse. If uh, the right-hand limit equals 7, then that implies that the overall limit equals seven. Only one of these two statements is actually true. Um, so you should decide which one you think it is. Fair warning, I'm about to tell you. So this is the true one, because what it means for the overall limit to be defined is that the right-hand limit equals the left-hand limit. And the value that they're both equal to, 
is the overall limit. Here, if the right-hand limit is approaching something, the left-hand limit might be approaching something totally different, in which case the overall limit would not be defined. So being able to think your way through things like that could be important. This second question is about determining whether a function is even or odd or neither. Let me just remind you what that means. Even functions are functions that have a horizontal reflection symmetry. So if you were going to flip them that way, they're the same. Odd functions are ones that have 180 degree rotational symmetry around the origin. So if you were going to make this a pivot and you rotate the whole function that way, the function would remain unchanged. You can write down those geometric facts algebraically like this. Um, f of x is the function I'm interested in. If I write equals, that means I'm saying the function is the same if I do some transformation to it on this side. So hopefully you know that if I replace x with negative x, that's the same thing as a horizontal reflection. So this equation is saying my function is the same as when I horizontally reflect it. Over here, 180 degree rotation turns out to be the same as a vertical reflection and a horizontal reflection. So you can write down the algebraic condition for an odd function by saying your function is the same if you have a vertical reflection of the horizontal reflection. So once you have those algebraic conditions, you can use them to test a particular equation without thinking about the graph at all because you've expressed the geometric condition algebraically. So let's complete the problem now. If f of x is 5 over 2x cubed times x squared plus 1, you can substitute in that function for f on both sides here and see if the two sides actually do end up equal. So on the left-hand side, we have the original 5 over 2x cubed x squared plus 1. And I'm going to write equals question mark here as a way of representing that we don't actually know if this is equal. We're checking. So now I'm going to rewrite the original function, except I'm going to substitute in negative x. So here I'd have 2 times negative x cubed times negative x squared plus 1. So clearly, if I have negative x raised to an even power, all of the negatives will end up canceling each other out. So that's going to be the same as x squared, which means that this entire term of the parentheses is the same as the other side. OK, what about this one? Well, if I have negative x raised to an odd power, then you're going to have negative x times itself an odd number of times. And so that's going to be the same as uh, a negative on the outside of x cubed. And that's not the same as this side. So I can conclude that actually these two sides are not the same, which means that this function was not an even one. OK, is it an odd function? Um, let's do the same thing. We'll Write the function on the left. And we'll ask, is that the same as the opposite of what I get when I make the substitution? So let's make the substitution. <clears throat> um, notice that f of negative x is the same thing as we had on this side. So I'm actually going to write the simplified form. We know that we've got neg uh, 2 times negative x cubed, where now this negative is on the outside of x cubed. And then the negative x squared simplified to be just x squared plus 1. So because one of these three terms is negative, I could move that negative to the outside, and then it cancels with that negative sign there. So really, uh, don't, don't get fooled. I'm not saying 2 minus. I'm saying 2 times this negative quantity. So because those two negative signs cancel, these two sides really do end up being the same. And so we can conclude that the function is an odd one. If you're going to solve a lot of these kinds of problems, it would be worth your while to develop a more systematic theory about even and odd functions that would let you think at a higher level about these kinds of questions. So the kind of thing I mean is don't think in terms of particular problems. Think in terms of patterns. If g and h are both even functions, is it always true that 1 over an even function is even? that the sum of two even functions is even, the product of two even functions is even, the quotient of two even functions is even. If you can develop general patterns like this, then you could approach the problem in the following way. Here was the original question. 
Okay, so x squared, I know what that looks like. That's an even function. If I add one to it, that just shifts it up. And so just shifting an even function up is still even. That looks like this. So I know the part in green is even. x cubed, I know what that looks like. That's odd. Multiplying it by two is like a vertical dilation. And so if you vertically dilate an odd function, it's still odd. So it's like I've got an odd function times an even function. If you knew a general rule, like an odd function times an even function has to be odd no matter what, then you wouldn't have to do any algebraic work at all hardly. You'd just identify the basic families that you know and say, oh, that's even, that's odd. I know when I multiply them, they're odd. I know that uh, a constant over an odd function is still odd. And you could just reason your way through the individual parts and the rules for how you're connecting them together rather than going through a rote kind of mechanical algebraic process. Uh, next year when you get to calculus, you'll be doing a similar thing using limits. Um, there will be some facts that you'll learn about how to think about limits, but instead of treating every problem as its own problem, you'll start to develop some overall patterns for how do you think about when you combine limits together or break limits apart. And in general, a lot of mathematics involves starting with concrete problems, but then trying to generalize to more abstract categories and think, well, instead of doing this process for this one thing, how would I apply it to whole families of similar objects? Okay, these problems are about decomposing functions into a sequence of composed functions. This notation f o g o h is f of g of h. Um, and so hopefully you know you could rewrite that as f of g of h of x. So that's how the composition is nested. Um, so really what you want to do is uh, start with what is the innermost thing that happens to x. So if you were going to imagine this as a function machine, here let me break this out. So if you're thinking about the sequence of things that happen with nested functions, what's really happening is you've got an x value and you send that through the h function. And then the output from h becomes the input to g. So you'd send output from h as the input to g. And then the output from g becomes the input to f. And then the output from f is the output of your overall thing. So if you can sort of imagine that sequence going from inside to outside, that can help you identify which functions are the inner ones and which are the outer ones. So for this problem here, let's imagine it as a machine. So I've got an x value, and the very first thing that happens to it is I've got, I add three to whatever x is. So that would be my innermost function. And then the next thing that happens is I take that output and I run it through a new function, which is taking the absolute value. And then the last thing that happens is I send it through another function, which gives me the reciprocal. So that tells me not only what my three functions are, but also the ordering. So the innermost function, which is h, would be x plus 3, because x is the input. And then my next function would be the absolute value of whatever its input is. So if I'm defining the function by itself, the input is x. And I know the g function takes the absolute value of its input. So g would be absolute value x. And then f would be 1 over x. And you can double check that your solution works by actually recombining them in a composition like that. So you could say, OK, what is g of h? Well, that would be what happens if I plug in h of x as the x value in the g function. So that gives you absolute value x plus 3. And then you could take that and plug it in to the x value for f. So you could kind of reconstruct the original function. OK, so uh, here are the answers to the other ones. I am first multiplying by 2. Then I'm doing 3 minus whatever that was. So 3 minus x. And then the last thing I'm doing is taking the square root. For this one, the first thing I'm doing is uh, dividing the input by 3. Then the next thing I'm doing, so this one might be a little bit tricky to figure out. So you might be thinking of it this way. Oops, sine x over 3 times sine x over 3. But the problem is that doesn't have a cleanly nested composition. So rather than thinking about it this way, remember that this notation is the same thing as saying, take your sine 
and the output of sine becomes squared. Sorry, this is all so tiny and hard to read. Um, but if you rewrite it this way, that suggests that the middle function should be sine of x and the outer function should be x squared. Okay, question five, there's a lot happening in here. So we've got a rational function and you're being asked to analyze the end behavior, the discontinuities, sketch a graph and identify all positive intervals. Um, let's start with the discontinuity analysis. In my class, I actually introduced the term critical values. Um, and this is going to be an, a term that's important when you get to calculus. Critical values are x values where your function either has a zero at the x value or it has a discontinuity at the x value. Um, hopefully it'll be clear in a minute or a couple of minutes uh, why we want to group together zeros and discontinuities, um, like why we want to consider those in the same category and give them a name. Um, but for the moment, let's just call any x value where that happens a critical value. Let's also look at something that I showed you way at the very beginning of the year, which is I want to compare and contrast some different situations that can help you identify when does a hole happen, when does a, a removable discontinuity happen, when does a vertical asymptote happen, and when does a zero happen. So let's imagine three functions, x over x, one over x, or let's say, yeah, sure, one over x, or no, let's do two over x, and then x divided by two. And let's imagine the graph for all three of these functions. All right, so two over x is a dilated one over x. So the graph looks like this. And you can see that at zero, it has a vertical asymptote. And for x over two, that's like a dilated line. So you can see at zero, it has a zero. And then x over x would simplify to be one, um, but treated as functions, these two functions are not the same. The function x over x and the function one aren't quite the same because they have different domains. Um, they give the same output on every number for where their domains overlap, but the x over x function has a hole or a removable discontinuity at x equals zero, because if you were gonna plug in zero, zero over zero is undefined. These three examples illustrate a kind of a rule of thumb you can use. Um, this is not a careful or formal argument and it can go wrong. Um, but let's say you've got some, some function like this. If you were going to substitute in an x value and you end up getting zero over zero, that's like what happens for this simple one when you plug in zero. So if you've got another function and you try and evaluate it and you end up getting zero over zero, that's a sign that you might have a removable discontinuity. If you've got a function and you plug in a particular x value and you end up getting a number divided by zero, where the number up here is not zero itself, um, then that suggests that you might have a vertical asymptote. And then this example suggests that if you have a function and you plug in an x value and you get zero over a number that's not zero, then you have a zero happening there. So this is a rule of thumb for identifying zeros, vertical asymptotes, and removable discontinuities. So let's go back to this function. If I wanted to find where are all the zeros, I'm looking for all of the x values I could plug in that would make the numerator zero while not also making the denominator zero. So it's not enough to just check if the numerator is zero. Um, because if the denominator is zero, you don't actually have a zero, you have a removable discontinuity. So before you go ahead and start plugging and chugging, it's worth your while to see if uh, any of this simplifies at all. So one thing I'm noticing is we've got four minus x and x minus four. So what I know is that uh, x minus four is the opposite of four minus x. In other words, um, x minus four equals the opposite of four minus x. And you know that that's true because you could substitute the negative sign back in and see that uh, both sides are equal. So let's do the reverse of that process. I'm going to factor out a negative sign from the x minus four. So I'm going to get uh, x minus four is the same as negative four minus x. So in the denominator, I'm going to have negative 
4 minus x, and then I'll have the other factors in there as well. And then in the numerator, I'm going to have my 4 minus x squared times my negative 3x. Okay, so why was that a helpful thing to do? The reason that's helpful is because it shows us that something cancels, but I don't want you to just blindly cancel. I want you to think about the meaning of what that canceling is telling you. Um, if I have a 4 minus x in the numerator, I can break one of those out. I've got my 4 minus x in the denominator, which I'll also pull out, but the negative sign is still there in the rest. So rather than just like crossing things out, I'm thinking about actually uh, pulling each factor out to form its own expression here. What is this expression equal to? Um, well, this expression is always equal to one at every single value in the domain, except for x equals four. And at x equals four, it's undefined. So the way I'm thinking about this is I've got some function and I'm multiplying it by a function that's equivalent to one everywhere except for four. So what that's doing is it's not actually changing any of the y values of this function, but it is introducing a whole at x equals four. So uh, in my class, we had called this a fancy one because it's equivalent to one, but it looks fancy. Um, and whenever you multiply uh, a rational function or anything uh, by a fancy one, the effect that that has is just introducing a whole, that's it. So if you were to cross these out and remove them entirely, that would be like filling the removable discontinuity. It's like you're filling the hole. Um, the reason you're filling it is because you're removing the thing that introduced it in the first place. So what this whole analysis tells us is that if this part of the equation never existed at all, if this was the original problem, when I plug in x equals four, I get zero in the numerator and I get something that's not zero in the denominator. And so that implies that for this function, it crosses the x-axis at x equals four. It has a zero at x equals four. But this wasn't the original problem. The original problem had this fancy one involved um, and the fancy one inserted a removable discontinuity. It inserted a hole right at the value where x equals four is. So without that part, it would have been equal to zero. But with this part, um, there's a hole there. So what we've got so far is x equals four is a removable discontinuity. Um, let's see what else we've got. So if I plugged in zero, that would make the whole numerator zero. And just sort of by inspection, I can tell that the denominator is not gonna be zero. So x equals zero is a x-intercept, it's a zero. Um, and then what else do I need to find? I guess vertical asymptotes. So I know you have a vertical asymptote whenever the denominator is zero and the numerator is a non-zero number. Um, so it seems like that's going to happen uh, where? When x is negative two would make that term zero. Uh, when x is negative one half, that would make that term zero. Um, and we've already analyzed what would happen when x equals four, and so that case is covered already. So these two are vertical asymptotes. So let's sketch what we got so far. I know that at x equals zero, we've got a zero. At x equals four, we have a removable discontinuity, but when you actually uh, remove the removable discontinuity by making that cancellation, if you were gonna plug in x equals four, it would tell you the y value, uh, which is where the hole is. Um, and so we know that our hole is actually at uh, zero. And then we've got these asymptotes at negative one half and negative two. So I'll draw one right here and one right there. Oh, we didn't do the end behavior. Let's do the end behavior. So I'm looking at the degree of the numerator and the degree of the, the denominator. So here the degree of the numerator, I've got an x squared times another x. So I know it's a cubic function on top and I see three linear factors on the bottom. So I know it's a cubic on bottom. So if the degree of the bottom and the top are the same, um, that implies that you're gonna have a horizontal asymptote and I'll show you why. 
Um, imagine multiplying all of that out. Uh, here, let me get a blank sheet of paper. If I multiply all of this out, um, I'm not actually going to do it, but imagine what the highest degree term is going to look like. So here, when I square this, I'm going to have a positive x squared, and then I'll multiply that, multiply that by negative 3x. So I know my leading term is going to be negative 3x cubed. And then I'll have some, some number of x squareds, and then some number of x's, and then some constant. Um, and I, I don't actually care what those are, so I'm going to... I'm going to leave the coefficients out for the moment. Um, but we can imagine that they're there. OK, so what about the denominator? If I multiply all these out, um, my leading term is going to be x times x times 2x. So that would be 2x cubed. And same thing in the denominator. I'm going to have some other terms whose coefficients I don't really care about. So let me tell you why we don't actually care about them now. Um, if I want to know about the end behavior, that's like me thinking, what happens to these y values as x gets very, very large? So I'm interested in the limit as x approaches infinity of that expression. So let me do this informally first and then more formally. So as x gets very, very large, one of let's just look at the numerator. One of these terms is growing much, much faster than any of the other terms, and it's the x cubed. Uh, what it means to be growing faster is if you were going to write out like a data table where you plug in higher and higher x values and you actually plug in what is each of these terms equal to before you add them all up, you'd see that as your x values get larger, the x cubed value is getting much, much larger, much faster than any of the others. So what that means is that if you ignore them, if you neglect these smaller terms, um, your numerator isn't going to be exactly equal to negative x cubed, but it's going to be very close to negative x cubed. And the larger x gets, the closer your y value is going to get to negative x cubed. Um, if that's not obvious why that should be, wait for a second and we'll do a slightly more formal version which might make it clearer. Um, but the same thing in the denominator, the highest degree term dominates the other terms, um, which means that you're allowed to ignore them as long as you remember that by crossing them out, you're not saying that uh, your y value is equal to this new version. You're saying it's very close to it as x gets very, very large. So if we're allowed to ignore those, then we can say, aha, so when x gets very large, our original y value is very close to this new simplified y value. And if I simplify it even further, the x cubed cancel, and I get negative 3 halves. And so that would tell me where the horizontal asymptote is. Remember, uh, the whole idea of it being a horizontal asymptote is I am approaching that value. I'm never reaching it. And that's part of why it's OK to do this thing where you're neglecting the, the non-dominating terms. Um, if that all seemed uh, a little hand wavy to you, uh, like very unreliable to trust your intuition that way, um, here is a slightly, hopefully more satisfying version. Um, to do this properly, you would have to know more things about limits, but, but this is like getting there. So let's have our original expression. Well, hold on. So let's imagine our original expression. Um, I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 over x cubed. So I'm multiplying by 1 over x cubed divided by 1 over x cubed. OK, is that OK? Well, I've got 1 over x cubed divided by itself. So that's like multiplying by 1. Um, so I haven't actually changed the value. Um, notice that if x equals 0, then I'm multiplying by something that's undefined. So doing this multiplication does introduce a hole at 0. But since I'm trying to see what happens as x approaches infinity, I don't care about the fact that I've introduced a hole at 0. All right, so I haven't actually changed the problem um, by multiplying by this fancy 1. But look at what happens. If I distribute the 1 over x cubed by multiplying it into each term here, I've got negative 3x cubed times 1 over x cubed. And the x cubeds cancel. So that gives me negative 3. 
The next term, I've got some number of x squareds, and I'm multiplying that by 1 over x cubed. So that's going to give me, let's write it out, some number of x squareds divided by x cubed. All the x's cancel except for one of the ones in the denominator. So that gives me whatever my coefficient was divided by x. The next term is the same. I've got something, some number of x's divided by x cubed. And so I end up with x squared in the denominator and my coefficient in the numerator. And then for the last term, I've got just a, a number, a real value, and I'm multiplying it by 1 over x cubed. So that's the same thing as my value over x cubed. So the exact same thing happens in the denominator. Um, so let's write that out. Here for this term, the x cubeds cancel. For the next term, and the next term, and the next term, the pattern will be the same as the numerator for the same reason. So all of that algebraic work was just a way of justifying our intuition that these other things um, should disappear as x gets very large. Because think about it this way. Each of these green circles is a number. It's a coefficient. As x gets very large, what happens to a number over x? Well, it doesn't matter what this number is. Even if it's a very large number, x is going to grow even bigger. So as x approaches infinity, this term is approaching 0. And this term is approaching 0 even faster. And this term is approaching 0 even faster. However, this term is just always negative 3. So this is like saying, imagine what happens as x gets larger for an expression where I've got negative 3 plus a bunch of stuff that are getting closer to 0. If I want to know what happens in the limit, I can just imagine that these are so close to 0, they're not affecting the overall outcome. And so that's why you're allowed to ignore them. Well, of course, that was just for the, uh, the positive side of the end behavior. For the negative side of the end behavior, you would want to imagine what happens as x approaches negative infinity. Um, a similar analysis applies, but if you just imagine plugging in negative infinity, in this case, uh, the negative is part of the x cubes, and so those would still just cancel with each other, so you would end up with the same horizontal asymptote. So putting that last piece together, um, we've decided we have this horizontal asymptote at negative 3 halves. For the last two parts, we want to sketch a graph and find all intervals where the function is positive. And these two are connected together. Um, what you have right now is several intervals of x values that are separated by the critical values where there are zeros or discontinuities. Within each of those intervals, the function is either going to be positive or negative, but it can't switch back and forth unless there's a critical value. Um, and we'll talk about why that makes sense in a second. Um, but what that means, practically speaking, is all you have to do is test a single value from inside one of these intervals. And if the function outputs a negative number, you know the entire curve within that interval is negative. Otherwise, the entire curve within that interval is positive. We'd done a kind of interval analysis in class, and I wanted to show you what that looks like. So let's choose an easy to evaluate number. Um, zero is already one of our critical values, so I don't want to use that one. So let's use x equals 1. What I'm going to do is for each of these factors in the numerator and denominator, I'm going to decide whether the entire factor is positive or negative. Because I don't care what the actual output from the function is, I only care the sign of the output, whether it's positive or negative. So um, let me get a new color. <clears throat> this this term right here is always positive no matter what because you're squaring it. Uh, when x equals 1, this term will be negative. Uh, this term will be positive, that term will be negative, that term will be positive. Okay, so if you put all those together, I've got negative times positive divided by positive times negative times positive. These two positives will cancel each other out, or sorry, those two negatives will cancel each other out. So I know that when x equals 1, <coughs> the result is positive. So what that tells me is that the curve is up here somewhere. Well, I know a couple, of, I don't know how far up it goes, but I do know a couple of things. I know that it has to be going down because it has to hit that value at 0.
And I also know that it has to be going down over here somewhere because it has to hit that hole at zero. So the intuition for why the function can only change sign whenever it crosses a critical value is that what determines the output from the function is the signs of each of these specific factors. And if I plug in an X value anywhere inside this region, all of these factors are gonna have the same signs. Um, so if I plugged in X equals two, a lot of the specific numbers in here are gonna change, but who's positive and who's negative is not. Um, so that's why it doesn't matter what number you pick inside the interval, you're always gonna get the same answer. Um, and then let's take a look at what happens when you cross one of the critical values. Uh, if I was gonna go out here to X equals five, I'm crossing the critical value that's generated by that factor. So if I plug in X equals five, look what happens. This one hasn't changed because it's always positive. This one hasn't changed because it's still negative. This one is still positive. This one is still positive. The only one that's changed is when I plug in five, this term has gone from positive to negative. So notice that when you cross a critical value, that's exactly when it changes signs. So as long as you're not doing something like squaring a term, which would be forcing it to remain positive always, um, when your term changes signs, that's gonna force the curve cross to cross the x-axis. And it might cross it a whole, um, so it wouldn't necessarily produce a zero, but it will cross it as long as you're not raising it to an even power. All right, so let's get the rest of this done. Um, I've got a horizontal asymptote here, so I know I, I might be approaching the asymptote from above. There's actually nothing stopping me from crossing and approaching the asymptote from beneath, at least in theory. Um, but for the kind of curve we're doing, uh, like figuring out which of those situations is happening is not the priority. Um, for this interval between negative one half and zero, well, I know I was in a positive interval here, so that interval, the adjacent interval should be negative. And I know that the curve is getting forced down to negative infinity by this vertical asymptote. Okay, well, if that was a negative interval from negative one half to zero, this next interval here must be positive. So we're gonna start in a positive region and head this direction. But I know that there is no zero here. So I can't cross the x-axis and head downwards. I've gotta head back upwards. And then this last interval on the far left is a negative interval again. So we're gonna start off negative and then approach the horizontal asymptote. And we could approach it from, from below or from above. And if you take a look at the sketch of this thing in Desmos, uh, it looks like we didn't do too badly. I think we've captured the overall shape of the graph. Well, that was rather lengthy. Um, so let's do part B of the same question, x squared over x. Um, what's happening at x equals zero? Whole, asymptote, removable discontinuity. So if we were going to simplify this function, you know that uh, one of the x's will divide, uh, so the x on the bottom will divide one of the x's on the top. So algebraically, x squared over x is equivalent to just x. Um, as functions, however, the two functions aren't the same because uh, the value x equals zero is not in the domain of f, but it would be in the domain of a function that was just x. So the two functions, so let's call, let's call this one on the left f, and let's call this one on the right g. So f and g share the same y values for all of the x values where their domains overlap, um, but their domains are different. So I know the g function looks like this, and it would cross uh, the zero, the, the origin there. Um, F has a removable discontinuity there. So the answer to the question, what is happening at F is there's a removable discontinuity, but if we removed it, it would be a zero. All right, so the next question is asking you to graph a transformation of the square root function without a calculator. Um, and obviously, if you were taking the test at home, you could just plug it into Desmos and see what the graph looks like. Um, another way you could very reliably do this problem is by plugging in a whole bunch of points and plotting them individually. Um, but that's not the point. 
the question I'm asking is for you to graph, um, but the method I want you to use is by thinking more broadly about which transformations are being applied and the order that they're being applied in. Um, so you can be sure that however we end up asking this question on the test, we're gonna really try and get at that part of the understanding. So don't get too focused on answering that question, be more focused on what am I supposed to know here. So we've got, uh, it looks like two horizontal transformations uh, being generated by this two and the six. And then we've got two vertical transformations, the four and then the kind of negative one half there. So let's back way up because there's a lot of intuition here. Um, and I think it's gonna be easier if we build it up in pieces. So let's imagine the parent graph of root x and let's just look at one horizontal transformation, this dilation by two on the inside. Um, so a lot of you probably know that this dilation is actually a contraction of the graph rather than what it looks like it might be, which is an expansion. Because if you think about an x value, I'm taking my x values and I'm multiplying them by two and that really feels like they should be stretching out in this direction. So the first target for understanding is like why exactly does that not happen? Why does this behave the opposite of what your intuition might say that it should? One way to answer that is by imagining the function machines the same way that we did in the problem where we were decomposing compositions. So the first thing that happens to x is it passes through this inner function which multiplies it by two. And then there's an output. And then the output from that goes to the square root function. And then there's an output. Okay, so this graph over here is just a graph of that part where, oops, where this is the input and that's the output. Let me draw a little blob there. Okay, um, so like let's take a key point on this graph. I've got one, one. So if the input to the square root function is one, I know that the output is one. Um, but the problem is for this function, if I plug in an x value of one uh, over here, First, it gets multiplied by two. And so uh, the y value when x equals one is not the same uh, because the, the x value gets changed before it gets sent through the square root function. So if we wanna know what x value acts like this point here, let's call this point A. I wanna know in my new graph, what point acts like the point A? And so that's going to be some x value where I send it through my multiplying by two. And then after I've sent it through that inner function, it ends up as one. Because I know that the x value that ends at one now creates this point uh, whose output is one. So whatever point here turns into one is going to be the point in my new graph that acts like A. So how can I figure out what that is? Well, you have to kind of think backwards. It's almost like you're solving an algebraic problem. I want to know the inside here, what value for x is going to end up producing one. So I'm solving two x equals one, um, which is clearly uh, x equals one half. You could think about it just kind of more naturally here as well. Uh, going in this direction, I'm taking an x value and multiplying by two. If I know what my output is, one, and I wanna figure out what created it, all you have to imagine is how do you undo that operation? This direction was multiplying by two, so the other direction would be dividing by two. So another way of saying that is for every single point on this curve, the x input that will act like that point gets multiplied first. So if you wanna take this curve and think about which x values act like each of these points, it's all of the x values that are half of what they are in this graph. So I'll take this point at one, one, and it gets mapped into the point at one, half, one. I could take the point at four, two, over here. And the point at four, two would get mapped into the point at two, two, because I know that the x value gets multiplied by two before we run through the square root function. So that's why the graph is going to, oh, I've drawn it looking exactly the same here, but the scale has changed. 
that's why the graph compresses. It's because this multiplying by two, because it's happening on the inside before you run your x values through the function, you have to undo it in order to figure out the effect that it's having. And that undoing is what actually tells you what's happening to all the points. So that's why the transformation has the opposite effect of the one that you might expect. So now let's extend that type of analysis. Let's look, well, so this was our original function, but if I wanna look at the horizontal transformations only, that's the ones that are happening inside the function before we run the value through the square root. So here I've got two transformations. I've got this contraction by a factor of two, and I've got this plus six, um, which you know is shifting left by six. Um, before we do a detailed analysis of that, well, let me say, so the, the learning goal here is which order do those two transformations happen in? Um, let's just think like graphically for a moment. Mm, let me get a new sheet of paper. Here's what I mean by the order. So let's take our square root function. Looks like this. So one thing that might be happening is I might be uh, contracting first and then shifting. Or if the transformations happened in the other order, I'd be shifting first and then contracting. Um, let's just look and see what we would expect for those two different orders. So if I'm going to contract first and then shift, what that would look like is, um, let's pay attention to what's happening to this point at 4, 2 maybe. So if I'm gonna contract first, the point at 4, 2, well, so 0, 0 stays at 0, 0, the point at 4, 2, goes to the point two, two, okay? Um, so that's contracting. And then if I'm gonna shift, that whole thing goes left by six. And so I'd end up with this point at negative six, zero, and then I'd have a point at negative four, two, like this. Oops. Okay, and so resist the urge to try and figure out, is that really happening right now? Let's just think about the possibilities. So this would be first contract, then shift. If I was going to shift, then, then contract, uh, when I shift, this zero ends up at negative six. And the point at four, two ends up at negative two, two, like here. Um, but then I'm gonna contract, and when I contract, the negative six gets divided by two, so it ends up at negative three. The negative two gets divided by two, so it ends up at negative one. And so it would look like this. So I'd have a curve where this is negative three, and this is negative, whoops, negative one, two. Okay, so these two outcomes look very different. Um, in particular, this one uh, has a zero at negative six, and this one has a zero at negative three. So the order that you apply the transformations in is really important, it really matters. So obviously you could just test inside the function here to see which one of these is actually going to work. Um, in fact, why don't you think about that for a second? So pretty clearly if I plug in x equals negative six, that would multiply by two first. So I'd have negative six times two is negative 12 plus six doesn't give me a zero on the inside, which means that I won't get a zero as an output. So this is not, not the one. Uh, let's make sure this one is the one. So here I've got a negative three. When I multiply that by two, I get negative six plus six has now given me zero. So this is the one that works. Um, all you've done here is exactly the same thing that we did with the pictures in the last analysis though. Let's reproduce it just so that you can see. So in this case, if we look at the operations that are applying to any x value that we plug in, the first thing that happens to x is we multiply it by two, so we pass it through that function. Then we add six, so we pass it through that function. Then the output from this process is the input to square root, um, and that's that's the original parent. So just like before, um, if we think about the point at, let's think about the point that we just did. So I know if the input here is zero, the output will be zero. So if you wanna figure out in the new graph with all these transformations applied, what X value here 
is going to end up as the zero point. So in order to do that, you have to undo both of those steps in that order. So if I want to first undo adding by six, I'm gonna subtract six, then I'm going to divide by two. So the fact that you're subtracting six is what explains why the plus six here actually means a left shift. The dividing by two is what explains why the two here actually means a contraction. But the order here reveals the order that the operations should get applied in. Um, and what I mean by, so the order in this direction is uh, the order that the transformations will apply to the graph. Um, and it's the reverse order that they apply if you were to plug in a number. And the reason why is because you have to undo them in order to figure out what X value will end up acting like a particular value in your original parent function. So uh, we can see that if you've got zero and you subtract six and then you divide by two, that gives you negative three. And you can very easily check the other direction also. You've got negative three, you multiply by two and you add six and you're back at zero again. So long story short, um, you can always think about undoing the operations on the inside here, on the inside of your parent function. And if you think about undoing, that will tell you, or that will give you a better intuition, not only for what's actually happening in the graph, is it shifting left, is it contracting, but it'll also tell, the, tell you the order that they're happening in. If the version of the question I'd asked had been like this, if I'd said y equals the square root of two times the quantity x plus six, if you were gonna think about that in function machines again, you'd have first x going through a plus six, then it would be going through a times two before going through the square root. And so in this case, it would be the opposite. It would be that, that left-hand branch that we said was wrong because uh, for x, you are first adding and then multiplying. So that means in terms of function transformations, the first thing that you're doing is you're doing your contraction. And then the second thing you're doing is your left shift. The vertical transformations are a lot easier to think about. Um, let's write them down. So here I've got four minus, um, so that would be like square root divided by one half if I was ignoring all the horizontal ones on the inside. So uh, root x over two is the same thing as four minus, oops, four minus one half times root x. So a good way of thinking about this one is this root x actually represents the output from the original graph. It represents the y value. So everything you're doing to this number inside my red blob is something you're doing to y values. So if I have my original, if I have my original graph here, let's take the point at one, one. Um, the first thing I'm doing, so if I plug in an x value of one, square root of one is one. So you can now imagine that this output is just one. So what am I doing in order? The first thing I'm doing is multiplying by one half. So that would be like a vertical contraction. And then the second thing I'm doing to the y value is I'm multiplying it by negative one. So that would be a reflection. And then the last thing I'm doing is I'm adding four. Um, you could tell I'm adding four because I could have written this in the other way. I could have said this is the same as negative one half times root x plus four because you can do addition in either direction there. And so then that would shift it up by four. So I contract, I reflect, and I shift up. Um, so that tells you the sequence of, or that gives you one way of imagining the sequence of things that happen. But there's nothing that needs undoing here. Um, because you're already working with a y value that's passed through the root function. So I guess let's answer the original question. Um, our analysis was very long to discuss, but it would be very fast if you were doing it in a problem because you'd look at this and you'd say, okay, to my x value, I'm multiplying by two and adding six. Therefore, for my x values for the function, the transformations that are happening are first I'm left shifting and then I'm contracting. So I've got that. Okay, what about y values? So for the y values, um, the first thing I'm doing is I'm contracting because of the dividing by two, then I'm reflecting because of the negative sign, then I'm adding four. 
which is an upshift. So I think a nice thing to do is to just take two points or maybe three points, figure out where they're going to map to, and then connect the points in a shape that you know should be a square root shape if it was transformed. So let's look at what that looks like. If I've got the point zero, zero, and the first thing I do is left shift by six, so now it's over here at negative six, then I contract it by two, so I know it ends up here at uh, negative three, zero. But then I also have to do the y operations. So if I have a y value of zero, first I'll contract it so it's at zero, then I'll reflect it so it's still at zero, and then I'll upshift by four. So this point A ends up here at negative three, four. Label that A. Let's figure out what happens to B. Um, so B, the first thing that happens is I will left shift it by six, so it ends up at negative five, and then I'll contract it, so it ends up at negative five halves. Let's write this down so we don't forget. Uh, what happens to the y values? So I'm at one. The first thing that happens is I contract to make it one half. Then I reflect to make it negative one half. And then I upshift by four. So now it's up at three and a half. And three and a half is the same thing as seven halves. So my point at b is going to be at negative five halves, which is the same thing as two and a half. So it's going to be sort of here-ish. And then seven halves is... Uh, what did I say, three and a half? So it's actually below this point at four, so it's gonna be kind of down here-ish. So that implies that the curve looks something like this. Um, and if you wanted to, you could figure out like what is this zero uh, for our transformed curve by plugging in x equals zero. So that would be, let's see, root six over two, so four minus root six over two. Well, that's not terribly informative. Um, but you could use it as a sort of a sense check to make sure that it's, for example, not negative. Like we're not, we didn't stretch it so far that it's down here. Okay, that's that one. Problem seven is a problem where you have to understand what each of these conditions is describing about a graph and then sort of like a puzzle, figure out what is a graph that simultaneously satisfies all those conditions. So what we know about f being an odd function is we know that whatever it looks like, it has to have this 180 degree rotational symmetry. So what that means is if we know a point in one place, it's also gonna tell us a point in another place. Um, let's do x equals three is a vertical asymptote. That's kind of an easy one. Um, and if I immediately put that together with f as an odd function, like imagine taking a graph that's got an, a vertical asymptote at three, if you rotate this 180 degrees, you're also gonna end up with a vertical asymptote at negative three. So that's the kind of thinking required for this problem is you have to constantly be trying to integrate all of this information together, um, asking like, what does this thing have to do with that thing? So I think we've covered that one. Um, I haven't checked this one off yet because this one is going to continue to apply to all the other conditions. So here I'm saying that as x approaches 3 from the negative side, the y values are approaching negative infinity. So here's my, oh, so I have an asymptote at 3. So if I'm approaching 3 from the negative side, that's this side. So that means my curve is going to be going down that way. And I'm only going to draw in that section because I don't know what's going to happen here. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go that way? Um, but I know that at least this little part of the graph has to look like that. Again, let's apply the odd function symmetry. So I know this part is going to have to look something like that in order to remain symmetric in the way that it needs to. Okay, so we've covered that one. Y equals negative 5 is a horizontal asymptote. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, if you imagine uh, reflecting 180 degrees or rotating 180 degrees, that's gonna give you another asymptote, three, four, five up here. Um, and the other thing you know about odd functions is, uh, you know, they look their end behavior behaves sort of like x cubed or negative x cubed, like one side Oops, sorry, one side is going to be doing the opposite of what the other side is doing. Unless it's the line y equals zero.
which is both even and odd. Uh, okay, so that's that one. So let's not read that one. So f has a zero at x equals six, great. So I'm gonna put a zero here. Um, and then again, because it's odd, that is also going to give me a zero at negative six over here. F is decreasing on the interval from three to infinity. Um, so here's three. So because there's a vertical asymptote here, I know I've either got to be coming up like this or down like this. The fact that it says that F is decreasing means that I have to start up here so that I can be decreasing. Um, I know I have to cross the zero here. So I've got two possible asymptotes. So I could head back up and go out this way, or I could go down that way. I know I am not going to head back up because that would violate the F is decreasing constraint. So I know I've got to, I've got to do that. Um, so now let's do the rest by symmetry. That means that this section has to look like this and it's going to go off the edge here, but this part is going to come up here and meet the horizontal, well not meet, but approach the horizontal asymptote up that way. Okay, so far so good. So now we know what's happening in the whole graph except for this middle section. What does the middle section say? F has a discontinuity at negative two. Oh, so right here where I, I made the dot, um, but the limit as x approaches negative two equals one. Okay, so what that means is that I've got a hole here at one because I know that as I approach uh, negative, as x approaches negative two, both from the left and from the right, we've got a y value of negative one, but the value of the function either isn't defined there or uh, is to, or has a different value. So I could put a dot up here, for example, or I could just leave it empty because I don't think it says that the domain is all real numbers. Oh, it does, does it? Ah, so if the domain is all real numbers, I can't just leave this as an undefined value. I have to put a point in somewhere. So let's just put a point like way up here. Um, and so then by symmetry, I'm gonna have a hole here. I'm going to have a point up here. <laughs> And then in order to keep the rest of it symmetric in the right way, I'm going to try and connect it. So that's sort of a very rough sketch. Uh, I on purpose didn't write it here because you might need to revise as you try and incorporate other elements. So it's nice to do kind of a sketch off to the side. And then once you're relatively sure what you want it to look like, you can copy it as your final answer. Okay, so that's that one. Oh, good. And that was the end of the unit five problems. So come back in a minute for the unit six problems.